Um, let's say that you had enterprise wide and they had uh, this uh, wireless uh, infrastructure. Uh, let's say it's a Cisco shop, so they're all they're using all the uh, air access points. They have the Cisco wireless LAN controller. They have one area of the building that has very uh, sketched wireless coverage. Instead of maybe spending a thousand dollars on an access point, they're going to go grab the two hundred dollar access point and plug it in. So these devices are in these types of networks, and they do allow an attacker to gain access to an enterprise network. All right, so players in the SO market, um, this is a non-exhaustive list. Uh, there are more, but these are some of the big names um, and the names that we evaluated. Someone started playing another video on the same machine this was recording on, so it screwed up the audio here. Users, uh, small businesses, Cookie Mark, my example, and the large enterprises. All right, so here's a list of products that we have evaluated. Uh, I categorize it by the vendor and then the uh, corresponding models. Uh, most vendors, there were two models that we evaluated. All right, so why did we choose these routers? Well, as I said, um, they're popular brands. Uh, the vendors are well known. Um, chances are, if something talks about Soho Router, you're going to know one or one of the vendors that was listed. Um, all of the uh, models that we've looked at have been given awards by like CNET or like Consumer Report, um, and they've talked up a lot. So they're a popular router that not only do the manufacturers. Hello, this is Iron Geek again. Unfortunately, the person recording this talk started playing the video from the previous talk, the one on hackerspaces, while it was recording. And unfortunately, that caused the audio to be overlaid. And I'm not sure if it was because it was close to the camera and it picked up the audio there, or somehow the software automatically puts it on there whenever it's seeing system sounds played. But regardless, people like Skydog and Dave Marcus and so forth projected a lot louder than... Uh, Jacob did, so it kind of overwhelmed the audio here, and I've put it in silence. Sorry about that, but it's going to be about six minutes, I think, before the audio starts up again.
just going to try and jam in a bunch of input into the uh, service and hope that it kind of just spazzes out. All right, so analyzing web applications. Uh, in order to, uh, I don't know, thoroughly assess the application, you have to understand how it functions, how it operates. And in order to do that, you need to know the types of languages that were used server side and the types of languages the client uses on the client side. Uh, you need to know the protocols and APIs used, uh, otherwise, I mean, how are you really going to develop an attack? Uh, and some great tools to do this is uh, uh, web proxy, uh, fire mode, and a web crawler. Um, I didn't list the specific web crawlers, there's a ton out there. You can even quickly script your own Python. Um, but Perk Suite is great. It's a very handy tool. Not only is it a web proxy, but it allows you to kind of capture requests, replay them, um, and then also use like an intruder functionality, which is, I believe, what you want to call a web buzzer. It basically takes the request and allows you to change out the inputs, the HTML, and HTML parameters, and just keep sending them to the application. Uh, Firebug is a great tool. It's really just the development tool that any browser has, but I like the interface it provides and the uh, uh, usability. Um, so I provide a few pictures here, just capturing a request at uh, uh, suite and then uh, inspecting some HTML elements in Firebug. So analyzing servers. Um, there's not much to do in this phase. It's pretty uh, simple. I mean, you really want to look for authentication. If a server doesn't support authentication, well, that's great. It makes that simplification map easier. Um, if it does support authentication, you need to know whether or not uh, anonymous access is available. You need to know whether or not um, the uh, uh, password is completely based. Um, or whether or not there's been misconfigurations. And by misconfigurations, I'm referring to uh, services like Samba that allow you to authenticate and then have access to content you shouldn't. And we'll kind of talk about that more later. All right, so yeah, static code analysis. So if the source code's available, we'll get it. Uh, <coughs> things for our logic flaws, so authentication or authorization. Um, and can you bypass authentication? Possibly. Uh, can you gain access to content without authenticating? Most likely. Um, and then you want to look for like functions not performing bounds checking. It's great. What's that going to lead to? Most likely, buffer overflows. Buffer overflows are awesome. Um, and then, of course, backdoors. All right. I don't know if you guys can read that. Can you guys read that? All right. So I'll talk about it briefly. I apologize. We need to change the resolution. So here's a piece of wonderful code from the Trinet Two Eight Twelve PRU router. And um, this vulnerability right here took user input. Uh, through the web application and it put it into a fixed length buffer. So not only did this cause a buffer overflow, they're also running system on your inputs. You have a command injection vulnerability as well. It's great. Alright, so buzzing, <coughs> dynamic analysis. Um, really, before you can start buzzing, you have to understand how the application works. I mean, you can do a kind of a sweet trick and just dev you random to send input to the application and hope maybe, hey, I could crash, hopefully. Um, but really, you need to understand the application and develop a smart buzzing template. And what I mean by smart buzzing template is, let's say the application had three commands, commands one, two, and three. Well, you obviously want to put those commands in a, uh, in a template so when you make requests to the application, they're going to properly be buzzed. And you need to know the types of protocols and the same reasons. So you're not buzzing, trying to buzz a TCP server with a UDP protocol. Um, I list some great projects here. Uh, one of my favorites right now is Spike. Uh, Spike's great, and when you hear me talking about templates, that's what I'm referring to. And I'll show you a template on an upcoming slide. Um, we use the Spike API to create web requests as well as a web server. Uh, Bed is a Perl script. It's great. Um, it's, you don't really have the ability to customize it, I guess, unless you customize the Perl script, so I take that back again. Uh, and then the MetaSlide framework, and of course, Python. Uh, Python's great. If anybody wants to just look up a buzzer in like five seconds, you can. Okay, it's after it, but it's pretty quick. Alright, so here's a picture of a slide template. Um, again, I'm not sure if you're able to see it. So there's a few uh, API calls that you can use in Spike. Um, that basically set up a request and s underscore string 
uh, with basically just creating non chain strings, so a constant string, and then s underscore string underscore variable, and those are going to be the plus points. And whatever you specify uh, in that point is going to be changed out with data by spike. So here I'm just doing a uh, HTTP get request, uh, setting the host header and the user user agent header. And then here is actually a, a picture of me using that template to plug the web server. Uh, so I come up with a few programs, generic send, TCP, generic send, BAB, uh, which will be used based on the transport layer protocol. Uh, you specify your, your uh, target, the IP address, and the port, the template you want to use, and it will start buzzing. Now, if you had a premature crash, which is causing overflow, you can resume buzzing where you left off. So you don't have to start over. <coughs> All right, so analyzing buzzing results. Well, there's a monitor for the crashes on the web. Um, a lot of times the service won't be available anymore, so Spike will just stop, or any buzzer will stop because you won't be able to get connections to that port. Alright, so tools. I mean, once you have a crash, or you notice that you might have a crash or some form of bug, uh, you want to load up a debugger and put the service into a debugger. Um, these devices, uh, defender devices, run with Linux. So if you have a feature of uh, and this is specifically for MIPS, and uh, this is while I was debugging uh, the ASUS exploit that I'll demonstrate live. As you can see, we have uh, 42s and a bunch of yes registers, and 42 is the hex representation of E. Um, and the system call tracer is another great one. Uh, you can attach it to the process, and as you're plugging in or crafting, you can see how it interacts and the calls that it's making. Alright, so gaining access continued. Uh, router, uh, router binaries um, are really a great piece of information. If you don't have source code um, and you can keep your hands in the binaries, you can use simple reverse engineering techniques to understand how this application may work, especially if there's no documentation, to then build your smart bugging template and hopefully find some form of bug. Um, additionally, for reverse engineering, you could reverse engineer the firmware. It's, in most cases, you don't have to. The source code will be available. Uh, but one thing I do want to note is most people that I've seen that do embedded device research, um, in order for them to get shell access on the device or testing and debugging, they will do some form of hardware modification. Um, in all cases where we didn't have console access and we needed to get console access before we could extract these binaries, we, kind of, we came up with the techniques that I call a jailbreak technique. So kind of local exploits that we did. Uh, used uh, on these devices that weren't usable remotely that then gave us access where we could extract the content we needed, perform simple reverse engineering on it, and then move forward. So some simple tools are strings, hex dump, and grep. Strings is great. Uh, there was one service specifically which ran on the ASUS router that I'll let me exploit today, this router here. Um, and the service was ACSD. I had no idea what it was. There was no documentation online. All I knew is that it was coded by Broadcom. Well, using strings allowed me to figure out the commands that the uh, device used or that the uh, service used, so we could then formulate a proper template, fuzzy template that is, uh, and was the service. And little did we know, we got a crash, and it led to remote code execution. All right, so here's just a picture of running strings. Uh, TP Link firmware, and you guys may see it, it'll show you information like the bootloader, um, manufacturer, uh, commands like I talked about, etc. Um, picture of grep. Uh, yeah, I wish you guys could see this, it's funny. Alright, so, has anybody ever grep for backdoor in source code? Well, if you haven't, start doing it. Put it on your list of things to do. While looking at uh, ShredNet routers again, uh, we were actually looking for command injection vulnerabilities. And as we went through the source, as we went through the source code, we came across um, this text that says "Add backdoor feature," and it was by Tom Hung. <laughs> All right, I'm like, what the hell is this? All right, well, if you look at a few more lines. You actually have uh, functions called backdoor. <laughs> So what this did is this backdoor allowed you to make a request to a web server with a static string and it enabled a telnet uh, server on all interfaces, not authenticated. So you have to run this. So this is the broadcast code. Yeah. 
It is, actually. We, uh, <laughs> right, right, here, right here, I'm listing uh, just one model specifically, but once I found this, I went to Grok on the website and downloaded some additional source code repositories and then looked through the source code, and yeah, it, it existed. Same app door. Uh, they changed some things about it, so it was pretty really great. It, it was definitely intentional. Uh, and I believe from other research, uh, this similar backdoor was discovered in Mace's devices as well. So, I mean, I don't know how many devices, uh, devices in that's uh, but probably a fair amount. So, yeah, direct backdoor. All right, so exploit development. I'm not sure if you guys remember all the vulnerabilities that we had on the list, or that I had on the list uh, of CDEs. But specifically today, I'm going to be talking about cross-site request forgery, command injection, uh, directory traversal, and bumper overflows. Um, and we'll go into them. Uh, we'll briefly cover what they are, uh, cover how you can mitigate them, and then how we exploit them. All right, so cross-site request forgery. Who knows what CSRF is? Anybody? A few hands? Great. All right, so cross-site request forgery is actually a very handy attack. It's something new, it's not groundbreaking, but it's amazing, and a lot of people overlook this, especially developers. What this allows you to do is take web application requests, forge them, trick an unsuspecting user into viewing these requests, or browser then executes the request, sends it to the web server, and will execute actions that the attacker chose. So as an example, um, let's, say, let's say I want to add an access to an application. And I do the request structure of the application. I can forge that request, post it on a malicious web server, uh, have compromised another website, posted my code there, uh, and then somehow trick a user, an administrator of this application, to viewing that code. As soon as they view that code, the browser then would render it, execute it, send it to the web server, execute the request, and I would have an admin account on that application. It's as easy as that. All right, so testing for uh, cross-site request forgery is pretty straightforward. There's two main things you want to look at. And those things are anti-C search tokens, so really anonymous. And then whether or not the application is doing refer or checking. Um, anti-C search tokens are basically a dynamic value that's added to the web form uh, every time a user logs in or every time they make a request. So this value changes and it's part of the request that the web server will process. And with this value excluded, the web server won't process the request. So therefore, how is the attacker going to forge the uh, HTTP form, or the HTML form? Uh, HTTP refer checking is another method that, when used by itself, is very worthless. Um, it can be bypassed, uh, but it, it would take a more sophisticated attacker to bypass it and not some script kitty. Um, these two uh, mitigation techniques can be used in conjunction with one another are great. All right, so just to counter measures, users, every time you're done with an application, log out. If you have an authenticated session and you come across a CSRF exploit, well, you're going to execute a request, and hopefully it's not going to do anything bad, but you have no way of knowing. Uh, developers, we just talked about this, implement both anti CSER tokens and refer checking. Use both of them. If you really want to take the extreme, make the users uh, re authenticate before they perform a state change, like updating user account information. So, those three mitigation techniques would be great. All right, so command injection. Who knows what command injection is? All right, a few more hands, great. So this is a, uh, based, by the, or based off the name, it's kind of obvious what it is. But this allows you to basically take application-specific commands and inject them into an application. In this case, we're focusing on a web application. And the web application is going to take that user input, process it, and execute it, and execute system commands. All right, so testing for command injection. It's really like any other vulnerability. You have to survey the application. You have to understand how it works and understand where there may be a command injection vulnerability. And in order to do this, um, you need to look at the application and focus on functionality uh, that probably calls underlying system functionality. 
Um, and some examples that I have here are ping and trace route. Uh, a lot of times, the ping and trace route commands that these devices have uh, will take the uh, input from the user and pass it to your system with ping. So you would have, then have the ability to chain commands and not only execute ping, but execute, I don't know, uh, rm-rf. All right, so some test examples that I have here. Passing examples for both Linux and Windows. Um, I think you guys should be able to read these. Uh, but really, okay, assuming that the command was just I have config, we can put a semicolon and then put an additional command and it's going to be executed. Uh, but Windows and Linux can kind of do the same thing, but we can do it with a pipe now instead of a semicolon. Uh, one of the more common command injection vulnerabilities that you'll find is going to be command substitution. And you have the ability to do this by putting a command in between backticks or in the dollar parentheses parentheses, which is very cool. And what, that, what, what that's going to do is first execute the command that you have uh, in the backticks, and then it's going to take the result of that and then execute it with the original command. All right, so here's a uh, very simple PHP script, like a few lines, uh, that's vulnerable with command injection, just to kind of give you guys an idea of what you can look for uh, in web applications. Um, this code is taking a get parameter domain, and it's uh, passing it to shell exec, which is the uh, system uh, function in PHP, and what it's going to do is execute dig whatever command give. Um, and what you, what you see here is I pass a domain, info set 42.blogspot.com, and then I chain out a command. So the command that I chained was cat as a password. The password file was returned uh, by the web server. All right, so command injection counter members. Users, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, it's a strictly developer problem. Uh, so they kind of see you take it in the butt, then you'll be all right. Um, avoid, uh, avoid calling shell commands uh, when possible. Um, in most cases, man, it's down a lot. In most cases, you're, uh, there's going to be an API that already exists or functionality that you want to implement. Um, and I provide a simple example of that here. Uh, using the Python system function and the OS module, you have the ability to execute system commands. And assuming that the third is a variable controlled by the user, uh, this is going to return the output of the third command into the directory here. It's taking an input and then chaining with ls. Well, that's one of the command injection. A safe alternative would be to use the lister function that the same module provides. And all that's going to do is take a directory and return the contents of the directory. It's not a directory. Okay, it's just kind of blanks in the directory. So it's not going to be one of the command injection. All right, so here's the first demo. Uh, we're basically going to tie two vulnerabilities uh, together here in the Trendnet router. Uh, we're going to be attacking this router from a remote perspective. So this demo is going to use two internal IP address ranges, but they're separate subnets. They're different classical networks. So it's showing how uh, one is segmented from the other. Um, and what, uh, what we're going to do is leverage cross site request forgery to forge application requests. And one of the requests that we're going to forge is vulnerable to command injection. So we're going to send that request several times to execute a series of commands. And this one's a video, so I'm not doing it live. <laughs> Uh, kind of. I just set up two separate network segments. Uh, so, like the WAN side of one of the routers was just a network network. Okay. Uh, yeah, you guys can't see that at all. It's just a word to do the lights up there. Yeah, maybe this we get the lights. Oh, it's kind of making it very, very Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Can you guys see it? No. no. All right, all right. Well, forget it. We'll just, we'll just talk about it. So all I'm showing you is the source code for this vulnerability. Um, it's on the IC website, so if you're curious, you can go to the website, check out the source code. Uh, SecurityEvaluators.com, go to case studies, and you'll find uh, both uh, of the papers that I mentioned. Uh, my slides are also there. All right, so uh, basically what we're doing in this code is um, we're making several requests, like I said, and the first request that we're making is enabling a port forward, uh, forward port 23 uh, to the router itself. So uh, a remote attacker, in this case, connected to port 23 from the WAN side of the router, the router is then going to forward it to its internal port 23. Um, so that's the first request that we set up. Uh, this one or this exploit doesn't uh, require that request to be there, but for my testing, it made it more stable and more reliable. So I put it there for stability purposes. Uh, the second request that we're going to make um, it, uh, starts with Telnet server. And the Telnet server is going to be started, it's going to be running on port 24, if I recall, um, and not require any authentication, drop you right into a shell. All right. Well, the third request. Uh, we had to set up IP tables, and you would think that it'd be as simple as, or it would be as simple as, all right, I'm going to create the IP tables rule, and then I'll have access to tell them. Well, well, you know, I found that there was a form for our race condition um, in this device, and as soon as you added a firewall entry, within a few seconds, that uh, device was going to just kind of revert its firewall. So you had a very, very, very small window and a small chance to gain access to this telnet service. Um, so what we had to do was write a small shell script that we used for command injection that basically was a while loop that would add this rule 25 times and then you would get in. After it ran 25 times, it would flush it and it would run again 25 times, flush it, run again, and it prints and repeats. Alright, so I'm trying to fast forward this. You guys can see that, right? Alright, so this is the source code. Actually, I apologize. One second. You should be able to see the Spark one too. Alright, so that was the attachment machine I just showed you that the address was quick. Right now I'm trying to tell that to the router. Uh, just to show you that we can't currently access the router. Or uh, agree. Uh, confirming that the web server started, so we can use the web server uh, to launch the cross-site request worker exploit. All right, so now we're on the Windows XP machine. The operating system doesn't matter for C server attacks. Uh, showing you that the internal network was a uh, class A network of 10. We're going to log into the router. The WAN IP address. 192.168.111, we try to tell that to. Alright, so here we're going to launch the cross site request worker attack. Obviously, the victim is then going to type this in if we were doing it in real life. Um, but as you can see, several windows were open. It submitted several requests to the router, and the requests were what I stated. We're enabling the telnet server, we're doing the port forwarding, and we're adding the IP table rules. So now, we're going to try to get it to tell that, and it takes a few minutes because of that race condition I told you. But once you finally hit the race condition and that data and those rules were added and we get access, the, uh, the script continues to loop and we'll have access for as long as we want. There we go. So we've got to shut. So if 
let's say this uh, web application gave us access to the var www directory, and that's where like the index.html and all the application is hosted. We would have the ability to access content outside of that directory if a direct universal vulnerability existed. Um, and here's a small example uh, to where we're requesting the password file, and it was in there. Okay, so testing for directory traversal. Again, uh, really test for any vulnerability, you need to enumerate the application. Um, and some great things to look for would be kind of like file-based functionality. So if you have an application that supports uploading files, changing files, uh, I don't know, creating files, uh, you should definitely look there. Um, a lot of times you find parameters like file name or uh, like file destination or directory, uh, those are great places to look for uh, traversal vulnerabilities in a web application. Uh, let's have you can get away with simple dot dot slash. You can take a step further and use simple URL encoding. Uh, this kind of allows you to bypass uh, very terrible uh, filters uh, that developers think we to try and uh, prevent direct traversal attacks. Um, one thing that should be known is. These types of vulnerabilities don't just exist in web applications. Uh, like C programs uh, can be vulnerable to these attacks as well. Uh, you may know them as dot dot slash attacks. Um, and additionally, uh, SME servers are also vulnerable to direct critical attacks. And here's an example of that. Uh, we were using Simlink. And we were, in the case of routers, we were basically given access to like a temporary directory. Uh, through one of the NAS services, SMB in this case, and we were able to create a symlink that traversed out of that restricted directory, or out of that uh, directory that gave us access to, to the uh, root file system, or anywhere else in the file system that we wanted. All right, so, so uh, again, very simple PHP code uh, that's vulnerable to direct traversal. Uh, this code is a uh, Get parameter file and it's including it uh, with var www and we're going to show you the contents before execution. All right, so uh, we talked about what directory traversal is. And PHP include is just kind of stuff where the code will also, also get executed, so you can kind of get code execution. Uh, we're not going to talk about that specifically. Uh, what you see here is uh, the file parameter is being passed in dot 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 or dot dot slash dot dot slash to traverse out of the var www and we go to the Etsy uh, directory and we request the resolve.com uh, file and that shows us uh, our computer's DNS links. All right, so directory traversal countermeasures. Uh, developers should try not to use uh, input in file system calls. Um, it can be avoided. There's really no need to do it. Uh, I perform path monetization, so all the sim links and dot dot slashes are resolved. Uh, and properly configure your services. And I'm um, specifically, or I have that whole item there for uh, Samba. Uh, sim links can be disabled. If you don't want sim links to traverse to the file system, but you still want sim links, it can be disabled. All right, so here's an example of a direct traversal vulnerability. Uh, this one is another video, and the target this time is the Ealing Dur 865L router, and we're actually going to use two traversals here. One is going to be an SMB simple traversal, and the other is going to be a PHP file inclusion. Um, it should be known that these embedded devices are very small, and a lot of times the implementations of software uh, varies or isn't standard. What I mean by that is this Beamly had a custom version of PHP that didn't have a standard include function, but it had a identical function that performed the same functionality. So what we're going to do here uh, in this uh, vulnerability is connect to the server, connect to the router uh, via SMB. We're then going to create a symlink and traverse into the file system. From that point, we're then able to grab the, uh, the credentials for the router uh, clear text, by the way. Uh, log into the router, then abuse the file inclusion vulnerability to get remote code execution. Yes, 
same deal. I'm going to skip over the source code. Um, again, this code is on uh, the IC website if you're interested. <laughs> So we're going to run the script right now, and we created the sibling. Um, we put a XML file which we knew or used as a file inclusion, and we're then given our root shell. So this would have been a little more clear in the source code. <coughs> Unfortunately, I apologize. Uh, check it out on the website, and I'm just showing that it was consistent access by connecting again. All right, so now I guess we'll attempt to do a live demo. Um, actually, I just added this one yesterday, and I forgot to put it here, so I'm going to put this right. Um, uh, what this is going to do is, this is again going to abuse a symlink uh, directory traversal vulnerability, and uh, we have the ability to really write anywhere we wanted in the file system. Um, so we create a symlink traversal vulnerability. Um, once we hit the hash the root file system, we were able to change uh, the cron directory and tell the router to uh, execute a file or a command of our choice. Um, once that happened, all right, we're running out of time, so we might skip this point. So I want to get to the good one. Um, actually, no, I'll show you what's doing for you. I just want to talk about it. I gotta figure out what the backtrack machine is. So once we get access to the router, um, we change the cron directory and we upload the telnet D binary, and we're just going to start the telnet binary. So let me see my IP address. Figure if you guys can see that. So while that boots, I will continue to do the So we don't have time. All right, so the last vulnerability we're going to go over is buffer overflow. Uh, buffer overflow are a vulnerability that exists because uh, too much input is copied to a fixed length buffer. And what that's going to do is overflow uh, the buffer that resides in memory and overwrite the adjacent to memory. And here's a picture of what the overflow on an x86 system. Uh, again, these devices were MIPS, uh, and the MIPS architecture doesn't work the same way that x86 does, but it's the same principle. All right, so testing for buffer overflows. Uh, the way you're going to go and do it is a hand analysis, a static analysis. Uh, if you have source code, if you get source code, you'll probably find the overflow. Um, if you don't have source code, fuzzing. And we talked about fuzzing and how to develop a smart template to fuzz properly. Uh, here's a quick example of a vulnerable code uh, that will allow you to execute arbitrary code. Uh, it's a very, very, very simple C program that's just taking an argument from a user and then copying uh, the argument uh, into a fixed length buffer argument uh, that consists of 42 bytes, or it's 42 bytes in size. If you supply an argument that exceeds that length, you're going to uh, overwrite the case of memory, and that's really a picture to demonstrate. It shows, you, uh, shows us running the program successfully, and it shows us running the program with too much input, which uh, makes EIP contain 42, 42, 42, 42. So if you guys are familiar with how buffer overflows work and how the call stack works on the program, the return address is on the stack, the return address is overwritten, and then when the function returns, that overwritten value is put in the EIP, which means we gain control of the execution of the Okay, so buffer overflow countermeasures, don't use unsafe functions, uh, compile with buffer overflow prevention techniques, so compile, compile you can use the important, and then perform bounce checking. Just don't use unsafe functions. And for whatever reason you're going to, check the link of the input before copying to the buffer. Okay, so the MIPS architecture, here's a quick note on the MIPS architecture. I'm not going to review because I want to show you this vulnerability uh, specifically. Um, 
here's the drop chain that we use uh, that we use in this uh, exploit against these two strutters. Uh, basically, a rock chain is allowing us to take existing components of a program's source code um, and chain them together. So we're going to take some of the code uh, while the application is uh, running and get it to achieve a result that uh, we desire, such as setting up registers, contain arguments, and functions that we want to call them. And then we're going to, once that piece of code executes, we're going to return to the next rock chain. And what Rock Gadget 1 would do would put Rock Gadget 2 in T9. So when we did the jump here of the Jaller, uh, we would then jump to Rock Gadget 2. And we would continue to do this until all of the registers are set up, uh, our shell code is in place, we jump to the shell code, execute it, and get the jump. Alright, I wasn't going to go over the shell code that uh, I wrote specifically for this exploit, uh, but I don't have time. Uh, these, this is online, so if you're interested in the MIPS shell code, check it out. Uh, MIPS is different than x86. It's easier to read, but there are more difficulties that you got to deal with. Alright, so we're at the live demo of the buffer overflow. Um, I guess real quick, we'll try the, uh, let's see if we have an IP address on this link sys. And we'll try it. Alright, great. Uh, so the link sys. Track five, so there now. 